kingdom and prayer is probably not going to be tolerated. Uh, they can't. I'm, cool. I'm kind of thinking you can try to be as, as polite as accommodating we can. You but. know, if you have one prep for it, yeah, you, you know. But, we have, we have you, know, Matt, you know, if she was in, you know, NBC, a head injury, you know, swelling, she was. She needs, she needs, she needs now. There's, no, there's no doubt about she that. Does she needs, she needs to start you know, She really needs my, 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 you know, gastrotherapy more than she yeah. needs prayer yeah. at this point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> So, um, the Emergency Medical treat said Treatment and Active Labor Act. I don't know what's going on with this last. So, this establishes specific responsibilities for physicians attending to the emergency department with patient. Um, the emergency department is, is actually a, it's an inexact term, but the provision of the law pertains to patients that are, who present on hospital property for the purposes of examination or treatment of a medical complaint. So we use uh, the term emergency department generally when we're talking about this, but what is hospital property? Parking lot. Yeah. Um, you have a physician's office that's connected to your hospital, the hospital property. Absolutely it is. It's hospital along that truck. Absolutely. So um, it includes uh, said the, the patients said patients attached to by staff and staff by hospital ambulance based services. So you're right. Hospital property includes arrival day ambulance in the emergency department entry uh, with a patient who was not expected or diverted but to a facility by direct radio contact. So the patient shows up, they have to be evaluated and treated. I uh, rolled into a small community hospital one day that uh, we diverted there. We were transporting an inner facility patient. We diverted to the small community hospital because of an emergency. And uh, we were still 70 miles from the tertiary hospital, so we needed help. Rolled in the ER doctor. We us at the day, the gate, no, no, like, wrong, we're here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You can't tell me no. Why? Like, that's not the way this works. Yeah. Um, medical screening. So, a hospital that, that operates an ED must provide medical screening examination to anyone on whose behalf a request is made for the examination. This is to determine whether or not the individual is having an emergent medical condition. And this is always that uh, question. Intella doesn't mean we have to give them the works. It's to establish a screening or treatment of active labor or an active medical emergency and transfer to an appropriate facility. So each patient, for the purpose of determining that they're having that medical condition, we have to figure it out, right? It's defined as a medical condition manifesting itself by symptoms of a sufficient uh, severity in the absence of immediate medical condition could reasonably expect to result in placing the individual um, in, <coughs> with respect to, or placing the of an individual or with respect to a pregnant woman, their unborn child, in serious jeopardy. So, I don't know how this is going to apply in Alabama, but, you know, that's a joke. Or Georgia. Or Georgia. Or Mississippi. I guess they signed one yesterday. I don't know. Missouri. Yeah, Missouri. So, an emergency medical condition is that uh, could be a severe impairment of bodily functions or a severe dysfunction of any bodily organ or part. Um, patients having a uh, Patient has a broken bone. Could that be a some, something that could cause a severe impairment of bodily part? Yeah. They're having a headache. Could that be a severe medical condition? We don't know. They've got to be evaluated, right? Uh, 
Alright. Well, it's working sometimes and not other times. Um, most of the Intel investigations revolve that actually get reported to the Department of Health and Human Services involve on call physicians who refuse to come in and see a patient late. Most hospitals are not willing to experience those anymore um, because most of them are actually have physician staffing. But we still do have some community hospitals that do have um, on call physicians. So Generally, on-call physicians are expected to attend to the patients, patients physically. If they refuse to attend to a patient or they fail to appear within a reasonable time, the facts may be reflected in the patient's, uh, in the patient's record and transfer materials. Furthermore, hospital's records must reflect the quality, assurance, and disciplinary records regarding the incident. So, all this is saying is um, these smaller hospitals that do not have physicians on site this is where they run into trouble with Intel as far as getting actual assessments. These are very, very, you know, remote instances normally. But emergency departments generally will have positions on site, right? Uh, it does still happen. You know, we have clinics that operate as freestanding ERs and may have on-call positions at night, but Active labor, patients who's having, who's having contractions is said to be in true labor unless a physician certifies after a reasonable time of observation that is falsely. So, as far as the definition of what active labor is. Necessary stabilization treatment. This is the uh, crux of Intala. What is necessary? So, the patient comes in to the hospital is determined that he or she has an emergent condition. They must provide further medical examination and treatment and stabilize said medical condition. Impala pre exempts all, uh, all state laws, uh, does not make exceptions for, uh, you know, said. Uh, the encephalic infants, comatose patients, cancer patients, and other chronic conditions that affect quantity or quality of life. The physician is held to the standard in making a decision uh, regarding the stabilization of the emergency patient. Uh, I'll get into why this is specifically important to us in a minute. Redirecting those patients requiring stabilization. Or restri or, sorry, restricting transfers until stabilization. Um, a patient may not be transferred uh, unless the individual requests the transfer having been informed of the hospital's obligation to provide further examination and treatment and the risks of, and the risk associated with the transfer. Or the physician certifies through that physician certification statement in writing that the benefits are reasonably expected from treatment of another facility far outweigh the increased risk to the individual and or the unborn child from affecting the transfer. A patient comes in in a trauma and it's reasonable to believe that they have internal internal injuries. They have an on-call um, you know, on-call imaging and it's going to be an hour before they can do the imaging on the patient. They can have you there to transfer the patient in less time. Which outweighs the, you know, which what benefit outweighs the risk? You know, further studying that they might not actually be internally bleeding, or there's really a risk that they they are. So risk outweighs the risk of transport outweighs the benefit of waiting. Um, Said so they may not transport the individual if the physician <laughs> is not present in the emergency department, or a qualified medical person may sign the certification. If the physician consulting with the person has made a determination that benefits of the transport outweighs the risk and subsequently countersigns the certification. This is why at the bottom of your PCS it says physician. 
PA, nurse practitioner, RN discharge planner. Discharge planner is not necessarily for the emergency department as much as it is, you know, leaving the hospital going somewhere else. But <coughs> the floor, or to a skilled nursing facility. But. And the transfer is an appropriate transfer. If you have a pediatric that's uh, <coughs> going, if you have a patient going from a regional hospital to another regional hospital that's having a surgical emergency, is this an appropriate transfer? One regional hospital to another regional hospital is not a specialty care center for a pediatric surgical emergency. Probably not, unless they have a specialty pediatric surgery services there that they probably don't. Um, generally, we say appropriate transfer to a higher level of care, unless there's something wrong with the care that you have there. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe your OR is being fumigated. You don't have one right now. CT's, CT's down. CT's down. Gone. Scanner's down. Wait. We have code black. Yeah. We, uh, uh, I'll tell you one exactly came up the other day. Uh, they jumped at Bragg and uh, somebody messed up. Uh, had 27 femur fractures. Yeah. Off of one jump. Off of one, off of one jump. 27 patients with femur fractures. How quickly do you think Womack and Cape Fear were overwhelmed? I can yeah. So you're having patients that in Cape Fear being transferred to other hospitals that are not necessarily higher levels of care, but they're an appropriate transfer because uh, in, because they got to go somewhere to get fixed. 27, 27 patients with fever fractures. Um, somebody did just somebody did somebody screwed up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, whether so weather related yeah, issues, the wind, the wind changed, they didn't change their approach back or something. A lot. Oh, 27. I was wondering why our, our OR was there at 2.30 in the morning. I'm like, why are they here? Like, it's real bad when, when Dr. Casey's here in the middle of the night. You know, he's a one of our orthopedists. Strange. I found out the next day what happened. Oh, everybody was working. Every hospital. So, patient decision regarding uh, their visit uh, was also addressed in the MTALA. So, documentation is required for each of, the, uh, each of the following instances. They have to have, if they refuse consent to, treat, uh, to treatment, the record must reflect uh, the examination and the treatment being refused by the patient. So, they have to, that has to be documented. A refusal uh, to consent to transfer it must be documented while the patient has. Uh, Transfer has been recommended and the patient's been informed of the risks and benefits, and it must be documented that they refuse, uh, refuse treatment right? and transfer or transfer. And this does happen. Patients, I don't want to go anywhere else. You probably don't need to be staying in you know, XYZ hospital. And sometimes even patients that discuss that. I'll have a conversation with them if, if I feel like it's actually going to help. Like, you know, I, I understand you don't want to leave your community. You're from here. It's cool. Um, I completely get that from their perspective. It's not really our place to do that, but I'm already there at this point. I mean, for a penny, a bit for a pound. Um, if they truly understand the risks of not, uh, you know, of staying where they are, staying where they're truly worth the risk of dying. That has to be uh, one of those uh, things they have to be careful of. If the patient or his or her delegate requests to be transferred, uh, the record is to include that re a record of the request, its uh, rationale as to the fact that the individual was made, be aware of the, of the risks and benefits of transfer. And let me uh, come from your perspective in the emergency department. How many times do patients request to be transferred somewhere else? Mm -hmm. um, a lot. How, how, how do y'all handle those? 
What is? Instances, you know, they want to be transferred for whatever reason. May or may not be appropriate. Um, every organization is a little bit different. But, uh, what is it? Fix. Yeah. Fix. Ooh. I'll open you up. And I did the same thing. Oh my gosh. Um, I, I took a grab your tissue and went, like, whew. Anyways, being transferred, you know, patients do request being transferred for any number of reasons. Uh, <coughs> sometimes it's factually justified. Sometimes there's reasons why they're <coughs> not going to want to have been transferred. <coughs> we have to go with what we got. We need to look for the most appropriate accepting facility. Many times that's a problem, finding an accepting facility to accept them, right? And beds um, needed. You know, we're a uh, we're kind of a unique animal where I'm at. We're an auto acceptor for stitties, which gets abused at times too because they get patients in our stitties. There's no beds available. We have to accept them. So, uh, regardless of what happens, they have we have eight overflow beds that no one knows that are in the cath lab, and we take care of the patients. The beds appear. So, we get the hospitals that'll call patients to stitties. It may not really be a stimmy. Or they don't know. They may just not know how to read the EKG. I don't know. That might be the case. Um, so, hospitals, full census. Patients don't come. We don't have a bed for them. Come, we cat them. I'm there all night. We care for them in our, our area because, hey, that's what we got. That's how, how it works when you're a tertiary facility, uh, when you're an auto acceptor on that standpoint. The appropriateness of transfers. A transferring hospital um, must provide medical treatment to minimize the risk of an individual or an unborn child. The receiving hospital has to have available space or qualified and qualified personnel to treat the individual that has agreed to accept the transfer of the individual. And the transferring hospital is, must send all medical records related to the emergency condition, including uh, emergency medical records, observations, signs, symptoms, preliminary diagnosis, treatment provided, and any test results, informed consent, certifications provided under EPTALA, name and address of the on-call physician is re refused or failed to appear within a reasonable time and provide necessary stabilization and treatment and transfer um, through the effective use of qualified personnel, transportation, equipment as required, including the use of medically appropriate life support measures during the transfer. And meet all the other uh, requirements imposed by, by the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That's a mouthful. Um, let me go back two slides to discuss something. Um, qualified personnel to treat the individual and accept the trace. Your Called to a facility to transport a, um, <clears throat> you know, fourteen-year-old that has a uh, that's going to have a gallbladder that needs to be removed emergently. <coughs> You're transporting a patient to a <coughs> hospital that does not have twenty-four-hour pediatric surgical services. It is two o'clock in the morning. This is, is this an appropriate transfer from? You know, they've accepted the patient. Do they have surgical services available there? What do you do? This, yeah, that, that's, I'm going to question, is this my best choice? Uh, why are we not going to <coughs> this hospital? I mean, if this kid really needs surgery, if the surgery can wait until tomorrow, that's fine. Uh, if that's... The true, you know, if the, if the patient's condition 
But if the plan is the patient needs that surgery as soon as they get there, and there's no surgeon available, it's not an appropriate facility. They shouldn't have ever accepted it. Um, so somewhere there's a miscommunication along the lines. And this has to get straightened out. Because when you document your transfer, that this patient was transferred to the closest, most appropriate facility, what are you going to do to document that? If you, if you document that you're taking this patient for surgical services to the closest, most appropriate facility, Falsified. Yeah, you falsify the record. Um, and when push comes to shove, I'm not going to, you know, a lot of us are going to be put in a situation where we're going to have to take this patient anyways. Um, when push comes to shove, I'm very clear up front with the sending facility and the physician who signed the statement that, hey, one, there's not surgical services available. I'm going to have to document that there's not surgical services available at this facility. And two, who else has to know this? The patient has to know this because ultimately Medicare is not going to pay for it. And that turns around and they're going to get a, get a bill for this that no one's going to pay for. And then they're not going to get the care that they need. So it throws a whole rigmarole. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of a real good instance where I can think of. This off the top of my head. It'll come to me, but then we stare here at us. Uh, qualified personnel. Uh, your patient is on a ventilator, and or the I say your patient. There's a patient on a ventilator, and the private EMS contractor sends their two EMT basics to come transport that patient from point A to point B. Is that qualified medical personnel? No, probably not. Um, does that fly in some places? It might. It's not good. It's not legal. Does it happen? It probably does. Um, that's a good way to uh, lose everything you own. Or everything the bank owns, maybe. <laughs> Okay. The other side of your coin, uh, all your basic trucks are busy and you need someone to take it from point A to point B. And said ER staff signs, uh, starts an IV and drives a patient running it every mil an hour just to get the ALS truck there. That is not Happens every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have, you know, the reason the medical necessity of the patient says mm -hmm. IV maintenance. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like KDO. I mean, oh, right. yeah. Really, they, they I watched a, um, they didn't know, they didn't know that the patient um, was, the patient's family member was a nurse in the in emergency department. And they started, this hospital started IV and the patient, so they could transfer the patient via ambulance. Patient's condition was stable enough. She's like, like I come in doing the sort of consent for transfer of behavior. She's like, why? Well, she's got an IV. I'm like, stop what? I'll put her in the damn car and drive her to the damn hospital. Well, that's wrong. Condition's stable enough. Yes, she needs help. Oh, we're talking about a rigmarole that throws throws that forward. But again, another save somebody a two, two to three thousand dollar bill. Plus, they didn't have to wait an hour for ambulance to show up and be transferred. <laughs> but that was their only reason for transferring is because they had high influence. Patient sits in, they get that ADA, he had another set ER for, you know, eight plus hours because, you know, that hospital wants to be transported by their transport system instead of. There for eight hours until that hospital friends up, said, you know, freeze up said truck. And yep, happens all the time. Unfortunately, unfortunately. So, 
Um, the hospital is obligated to ensure and document that the patient has been provided information regarding their obligation for examination, treatment, the risk and benefit of proposed transfer has been explained to the patient. This is the physician's responsibility to explain to the patient what, why they're being transferred and what the risks of that are being of, of not being transferred. They're basically, they're going to stay there. You know, we can't treat your heart attack. You're going to die. That's the long story short of it. The heart attack's going to keep going, and it's, it's not going to be successful. The transfer is only deemed appropriate if qualified staff possessing adequate equipment to provide the necessary life support measures in route to the receiving facility and the facility is agreed to accept the patient. So as long as somebody can monitor that IV, it's... I said that in jest. But, um, provide, you know, the necessary life support measures in route. Whether that be ventilator maintenance, infusion maintenance, Truly, they very well may need IV fluids. That's legit. The people legitimately need that. KBO fluids is that? Pardon? Is it KBO fluids? Yeah, you know, I mean, those, those, uh, that 30 cc an hour really, really improved that, that fluid volume. I told you it's just I probably do spit more than that. <laughs> That's what I'm talking up here, though. So, complete documentation includes informed consent records of medical examination. Treatment of patient must be uh, delivered to the receiving facility. And violation of this does involve significant civil penalties. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. So a hospital that knowingly and willingly um, violates Intala is subject to the termination of, their, of its provider agreement, i.e. they can no longer accept Medicare payments. How do you think that would impact most hospitals? Tremendously. Yeah, tremendously. This happened to Duke Life Points Hospital in Haywood County um, two years ago. They lost Medicare funding for three months. Damn. Um, they got it back. They got it back back. But it wasn't because of Intel, it was because of another issue. But three months of no Medicare payments? Holy smokes. We consider, I know most of our services are between Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, we're like 60%. It's a lot. Hospital may be fined between $25,000 and $50,000 per violation. And the physician who is responsible for the examination can be fined up to $55,000 per violation for knowingly and willfully violating Intala. And this also applies to the on-call physicians. They can be excluded from Medicare and Medicaid programs, which essentially ends their career if they become excluded from Medicare and Medicaid programs. Um, a patient can sue the hospital uh, for personal injury in civil court, which is much more extensive than the twenty-five dollars or $50,000. Uh, receiving facilities have suffered financial losses as a result of another, hosp of another hospital's talent violation can bring suit against those to recover those damages. And we'll give you some interesting uh, scenarios. A uh, go to transport a patient from a hospital, a small or a small hospital to a tertiary hospital, and we're, we get 45 minutes out from the hospital, and they call back and say, hey, you need to turn around. We didn't actually get acceptance. How do you mess this up? I've got documented this was accepted by such and such. Like, oh, yeah. That was a speech pathology, doctor of speech pathology. Like, who screwed that up? Like, I mean, I don't, you know, it, I didn't, it said MD in the accepting physician or accepting facility. Never thought to go research the freaking credentials of who, who it is. But they talk, they call and talk to the, uh, who they thought was the emergency department. And it 
was Scott. <laughs> I don't know where the hell they got this thing from. I'm like, well, you've now caused a major chaos in someone's world. Because the patient left an ICU and was going to a larger hospital's emergency department. And now that bed's been filled in their ICU because it's been an hour and that patient's come back. What do you do? <laughs> Um, the chaos of that, because they have now committed a, um, multiple violations, actually. But, and you know, our only way is we, we can't keep taking the patient to the hospital we're going to because they're never accepting. They're not accepting patient, period. Not our fault, necessarily. We still have to sort out and take the patient back to where they came from. They got to, you know, got to put a ventilator, got to ride out in town. This is a scary thing for me as an aspect of like, we're, we're going to pay the consequences for this somehow. But I go back on the way back, I have 45 minutes to look at the chart, I'm like, yep, they have a consent form, so they have a consent for transfer, they have a, uh, a PCS sign, they have a receiving physician here listed. Just nobody did their work that they received position. Not actually a physician. They're a doctor of speech pathology. Yeah. What? Who in the hell? So, of course, when mistakes happen, you know, that was an unintentional violation that, you know, no one willfully violated this. Is the patient needed to go somewhere and end up going to a different hospital the next day once they got acceptance at another facility. But, you know, making sure that your ducks are in a row, making sure all your paperwork's in a row before you ever get, you know, get on the road. I, I had looked at before we left, it's like, okay, it all looks good. Never would have dreamed that we get there and we'd have that kind of problem. That's a, that was absolutely a new one on me. I'm like, oh, speech pathologist, huh? I want to know who messed this up. All right, we'll take a 10 minute break while I get this next thing. Hold up, if I can stop this. I have, I have a six hour drive. So, uh, I'm starting the recording back because I want to talk about what we we kind of hatched our plan last night. Um, I'll stay for that. Yeah. <laughs> Just because you want to get your hang on. So, the cool cool thing, and I can't take credit for this, so we've got to give credit for credit to do a cool idea. Um, there you go, take your bow, and that's as best you're going to get from it. Um, I don't know what day, but probably one of the review days, I'm guessing, um, toward at the end of the class, but you have a series of escape rooms utilizing information that has come up throughout the course. Um, this could be everything from you know, different parts of a patient assessment, um, different parts of any formulas or calculations we're going to go over or uh, medication administrations. I don't have the full schedule yet, but basically you'll be in a room for 60 minutes. There'll be multiple rooms and have the ability to solve a puzzle. Your puzzle is get to get room. out of the room. Yeah. So you'll have different problems to solve and there'll be a few different rooms. So the, the, the goal, the, the, idea, so the, idea, the idea is four different rooms with different puzzles. Everybody's in competition with each other. Two, 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 two person teams. Two person teams. Um, and, the, and you actually do a, do a, a winning, you actually, the winner of the team will actually, or the winning team gets $50 gift cards. A $50 gift cards to somewhere. I don't know. Out by a Cool. Cool idea. Just, just a little throwing out there. Um, something that's going to be a golf shirt and a tumbler in case anyone would like it. She got a hard barter. 
But whatever day that's going to be, I'll let the schedule cloud. I don't really want to put it past Tuesday, so. It's basically like you have different puzzles, and once you solve like an equation, or like an RSI drug, or something of that nature, um, once you solve it, it will lead you to like code. So you have to solve the problem in order to get the code. And if you don't solve it right, you won't get the code. Once you get the code, it will lead you to another problem. You have 60 minutes to solve all the problems in that room to get out of that room. And you have four rooms. And whoever wins. Whoever has the best time combined of getting out of four rooms the way to So you can't tell anybody like what you've seen in each room. Because you're screwing yourself. Yeah, if you do, then no. you're just going to help other teams and then you're not going to win. Yeah. But we have, let's see, we came up with a board, a ER room, a hospital room, ambulance or an ambulance bay, and then a flashlight room. So the flashlight room is going to basically be like you go into a patient's house and they ain't got no electricity, so you have your flashlight. <laughs> and then there's a little twist in that, but I, I'm not giving y'all that. I've got to figure that on y'all's so That's the only advantage I have. <laughs> And she, she doesn't know any of the problems either. So. Yeah, I don't know any of the problems. I can't. There's, there's I no, can't help with that. Oh, no. The problem, that's, that part is still in creation. Of how we're gonna yeah, he, he's in charge of that. I can't know so, any of that. Just a cool, that's just a cool idea. Yeah. I am about to do something different, something outside the box that will actually make you um, yeah, have to remember certain things. And I know this stuff today is, uh, I'm sorry. I can't make ethics. Any more exciting than it is in your team, that's right. and I can't make Intel. I mean, it actually kind of it disgusts me at times to talk about Intel. Just so you know, um, it's not it's not cool. It's not woo woo cool shit. That's that's not um, it's not something I, I really enjoy. So I apologize. I can't make it any uh, better than this. I do want to do a little bit of patient assessment. I guarantee you we're not going to be here until 5, I say uh, 3.30, if, that, if that's okay with y'all. Unless anybody just gets up and walks out. <laughs> <laughs> you just walked in. Figure out who's watched that one? Um, no. I have charged it and it's in my car and I've been checking it like all day long and it has yet to pop up like saying boss watch to give me a number to call or anything. It's just on like, it's just still on. So I'm going to get like to see if it, it pops up. Like mine I, oh, no, I lost it. I found it. I'm going to see it. Can I have your old one? No, because I'll be scared. I've got the rest of this. I need a backup just in case they find it. <laughs> then you and me have been. Can, I, can give it to me? I know how to reset it, but the problem is, is if I reset it, take the passcode off, then it erases everything. So I won't be able to, like, once I get in it, I won't be able to figure out whose it is. So I don't want to do that. Like, I'm For two weeks. Yeah, yeah. 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 I agree with two weeks. Yeah, I want to make sure there's enough chance yeah. for him to, but, like, realize hey, it's gone. If it's, if it's not a hot watch, you would have you figured out how to. I mean, you can probably, you can take the serial number and call it. Apple will be done. Oh, so it's an Apple Watch? Yeah, it's an Apple Watch. They're not going to tell you who it is, but they'll, 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 they'll probably backtrack it. They'll get in touch with it. Unless it's stolen. Yeah, because you, you can't. Unless it's hot, yeah. You know, you can take it from your phone. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm waiting for because it was dead when I got it. And I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to figure out who it is. Because it's like, they don't want to take my password. So I don't want to do that. Once they ping it, it'll say, I found it. You hit the button and it'll like let them know that somebody's found it. It'll give you a number to call and let them know that you found it. Um, do you want me to tell Robert that we found it? So, yeah, you he can, can tell the cop. Yeah, let them know. Okay. That way they know that somebody's got it. Because okay. I don't want think I'm just like trying to like steal it. That you're it. trying to hold on to it, yeah. yeah I agree. But I don't want to give it to the college. You never, no. know, you never know what's going to happen to yeah. in there. Who says? Yeah, that's all you have to do. But it'll lock it so they're not going to use it. And it's. Yeah, but nobody's done that yet. And it's still like. I found the bees. Yeah, I would be like. I've been shaking it. Like, I've been shaking it. You found it yesterday? Yeah. In here? Like, outside of the parking lot. Oh, God. And it's like the fourth generation. So it was one side of the watch. 
Yeah. 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 Alright, so, um, down and dirty patient assessment stuff. So, a good patient assessment must be accurate, efficient, and reliable. And this is for any aspect, whether we're talking about a critical care patient or any patient for that matter. Um, I generally would like to say that we all do good, good jobs at, uh, I do effective patient assessments, but I can't say that about everyone, you know, being nice and all. Why do you say in hell? So, sources of patient information, your physical exam, initial care providers, other pre-hospital providers, hospital staff, patient's family, um, these are all, you know, sources of information. When I go to uh, get pick up a patient at a at a facility, you know, I try to get as much information as possible. This is not a rush. We're not in any super hurry. Uh, in most instances, they might want to get that a patient out, but I want to make sure I have all the details before I take that patient. Um, I like to know what I'm getting into. It's much um, more structured than a you call, we haul. So I have questions. I want to know, you know, lab values. I want to know um, if there's, you know, you know, depending on what patient condition is, the patient had, what their radiologic uh, imaging results are. If you think they're bleeding, have we done an ultrasound? Have we looked to see if they are actually bleeding? Is it going to change, you know, my course of presentation or my course of treatment? If the patient's on a vent, when was the last ABG done? These are things that are kind of important. I want to know this. If they haven't, you know, if they, the last one was done five hours ago, guess what? I want another one before we go, because I don't do an ABG in the back of the truck. So that's, that's absolutely going to affect my, uh, uh, my treatment. So it must be structured, rapid, and thorough. And assessment, management, and transport considerations differ in a critical care transport environment than they do in um, a 911 environment, by all means. So the one skill um, that is absolutely performed on every patient is your patient assessment. I don't care if it is being discharged from the hospital, going back to a hospital, or going back to a vet farm. A vet farm, you know, that. A patient's being discharged and having a uh, big stroke going to a, a tertiary care facility for interventional um, neuro procedure. You absolutely perform a patient assessment on every one of those patients. Perform before any treatment. It's an ongoing process, so we combine it with the data we acquired from our, to form a working diagnosis and determine uh, how we're going to manage this patient. Failure to perform that patient assessment or failure to uh, perform it properly can lead to errors in patient management. Having a structured technique is important to ensure uh, consistency. Instruction may be uh, may may demand dynamic assessment strategy, i.e. Um, what we talked about yesterday. It's all well and good if your patients you know, needs to be innovated, but if they're hemorrhaging from their leg, is that going to change my management strategy? Yeah, it's going to be you know if if they're gushing blood, that dramatically changes it. That's breaking it down to the simplest form. So your patient assessment is probably one of the absolute most important skills that you can have. The way you approach a patient, and I approach every single one the exact same way because I have a structured and methodical pattern provided there's nothing that has to be corrected. So if, they're, if the patient's breathing and they're not bleeding, they've got a pulse. I can function with my methodical pattern. If I need to fix any of those things, okay, we'll fix that and then go back to my, um, to my pattern and I'm going to continue my assessment. So, pre-arrival information, transferring facility uh, provides information to your dispatch center or your you know, whoever is actually dispatching you. Can provide 
know, we want to know if we're going to need specialty equipment. Is this going to be a vent transport? Is this going to be a uh, um, patient with a arterial line or a hemodynamic monitor? Uh, is this going to be a patient that's going to be on a, a cyst device um, or a balloon pump? You know, those are kind of important pieces of information. Before we ever get there, you want to know what the reason for transport is. A little bit of background about the patient. Um, interventions performed, procedures, medications, responses to those, and interventions expected to be needed during transport. It doesn't have to be a full detailed account. I don't need the 20-page chart before I show up. I just want to give a general idea what I'm walking into. Um, so you want to know vital signs, airway status, breathing status, circulatory status, um, lab work that's present, imaging data that's, that it's available, or pending, again, background data so that I know what I'm going into. So I can form a perspective in my head that, you know, I know this, the, what they say, oh, this patient's really, really sick when they're giving you the vitals. And like, oh, the blood pressure is 120 over 80, their pulse rate's of 80, 97% of two liters of nasal kale. Where is this patient here just telling me this? You know, crashing on you. you know, they have a IV saline lock and lift floor. So that's why I say perspective is one thing. You know, patient. You know, the perspective you're giving, objective information to kind of get that, so that I know if I'm walking into a you know a turkey shoe or not. Uh, distance for transport. So reason for transport. You want to know distance, transport time. And the level of care issues uh, for you know a patient being transported by helicopter. This would be someone that requires rapid transport. A you know a patient that's still within the stroke window for um, say for inter said IA intervention being um, intraarterial intervention at a at a stroke center being a UNC or Duke are the only ones doing it around here. But is for on that borderline cusp. They're four hours since onset of symptoms. Okay, four hours onset of symptoms. There's not much that's going to be done to that patient. But for an IA intervention at UNC or Duke, they can go to six hours. So, do I need to ground pound that patient from here to Duke or UNC, or do I need to put that patient on a helicopter so that they can meet that time frame? All important information. Uh, you know, it depends on how they're going to treat the patient, too. If they're not a candidate for it, then there's no point for them to be on the helicopter. Just in all reality. So, access to remote locations. Uh, we talked about uh, you know, specialty teams for neurosurgery, thoracic surgery, transplant uh, teams, um, surgical airways, so central venous access, and uh, generally, we say, our, our uh, air medical teams have a lot more experience because they go a lot more places. They treat a lot more critically ill patients because generally we reserve our critical ill patients for the helicopter. We have a habit of putting patients that aren't so critically ill on the helicopter, but um, we're trying to do a little bit better with that. So, interfacility transport is needed when the transplant facility cannot intervene. You must uh, we talked about it, Tala must provide the initial medical screening, stabilized to the best of their ability, ensure care is uh, continuously provided for transport, which is why we are there. And uh, generally, these smaller hospitals are where they're going from to a larger hospital. Uh, and the continuum of care should be seamless with the assessment, stabilization, transfer, ongoing care, and inner facility transfer um, is needed when patients and family requests. And uh, we do have instances of local, national, um, international transfer transfers. It's where we've run instances of companies like um, Phoenix Air that will bring patients back from the other side of the world. Because um, I actually went to a, uh, was that a function, that's the description I got. It was a fundraiser. And I could see at this table with this guy. And I'm like, they're like, what are you, you know, talking to him? And he's like, I'm uh, a medical support officer. He's a physician. 
like a medical sports officer in the Department of State. Like, what does that mean? What is a medical um, or medical logistics officer? Whatever, whatever. What is it? What do you do? He said, "Okay, so say you're in um, another country, you get hurt, and you need to get to the closest point of care." He's like, "That's my responsibility is to get you there as an American citizen." I'm like, "Oh, cool." So he's like, "For example, it's like you know you're in Florence, Italy. He's like, I'm going to get you to." And he named off the hospital. I'm like, "Well, cool." You know, we're going to get you there. I said, well, "What about like?" Uh, uh, I said, what about, uh, you know, one of these uh, countries like Saudi Arabia? He said, we're actually going to, say, Saudi Arabia, we have facilities, X, Y, Z, the coolest guys. So I said, what about a country like Russia? He said, we'll get you the hell out of Russia. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, that's, I said, how do you do that? He said, we have contracts with uh, private, said, private and governmental um, companies to do that. I was like, I was like, like Phoenix Air. Like, he's like, exactly. I was like, so you know who that is? I said, yeah. I said, okay. I, w I worked for Phoenix Air. I said, I just didn't know you're the guy that was causing all this problem. I was like, pretty, pretty neat job you got there. <laughs> like, what are, what are the chances of, you know, networking and, and a function in Boston? <laughs> so, um, history of present illness, we want to uh, know the HPI to plan our interventions for our patient, anticipate whatever complications might arise. This is especially important to the uh, critical care environment because our patients are generally of a higher acuity. They are generally sicker. That's why we're there to get them somewhere that they can be treated in a much um, more expeditious fashion. We have a greater number of medications and interventions that are available to us. Completeness is important because many complications can actually develop based on medication interactions, medication uh, maintenance, and uh, um, physiologic conditions. So you may have uh, adequate HPI provided on by on-scene personnel and staff. Uh, you may be required to obtain some information, uh, additional information. I'm not going to be to death with OPQ, RST, and sample, um, sample me. You guys are all, um, so all smart. Um, Oh, yeah, hey, apparently my computer thinks it's done. What's the ASPN? So the AS, ASPN is, is associated with symptoms and personal, pertinent negatives. So that's anything that's, you know, related, but, and then anything that's, you know, obviously negative. So I uh, had the, I just go real quick, the 33 year old. There, came in and had the big MI, I'm like, okay, I want to know one thing before they get there is patient been drug tested because 33 year old having an MI is really atypical. I figured this is a big um, coke and news, you know, STEMI and they have one negative. I'm like, holy crap, what? Is, is that the female? Yeah. Yeah. Is it either they're going to be back or that's tough. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm like 33 years old. I'm calling Bull crap. Um, we've got we do that whole until you see it come through the door. And I've gotten my, myself burned on this bad the last few weeks. Uh, um, the one last week I called in for, I'm like, oh, the EKG is not impressive. Oh, that's VFib. We need to do something about that. So the EKG on the, from the hospital was not all that impressive, but the VFib straightened that right out, didn't it? I shocked that in. It seems like every time I need it, the life pack takes longer and longer and longer to shot. I'm like, my cardi the cardiologist there, I'm like, we could have let, let that see if it came out. I'm like, she's in VFib for like 36 seconds, okay? You know, I'm not going to let it go much longer than that. We have a patient that was beautiful, beautiful signs with and flipped him over from the bed with a stretcher and I went into bite him. And I was one of those ones. Let it, let it let's go. Yay. We're gonna start putting. We're, we're gonna start getting ready for a train the penis pacer. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, that wire is not attached. There we go. That's why that V fibs there. Well, current interventions and medications being administered. 
uh, we could be so we could be determined by assessing your patient, communicating with your transporting personnel, and they can really reveal a lot about uh, your patient's condition. So we need to know what advanced airway procedures have been done, and also um, if there's multiple medication infusions going on. I always can't stress enough when you go into a patient that has multiple lines, multiple pumps, multiple uh, um, things going into them, that's where you can put things in a lot of places, right? Um, I say that jokingly, but I always backtrack each individual line, and ERs are notorious for it being a big, you know, chaos. Uh, IV lines convoluting and being tied up. Uh, that's why I love getting patients from the ICU, because they get a lot more anal retentive about where their lines are going and what's going on instead of this mess that, that I get in the ER. I'm like, I've got to straighten this out for this patient if he gets off his bed. So backtracking your lines, knowing where everything is, knowing what it is, writing it down, because inevitably something dies in the way and the pump fails and I have to reset it. I can't remember anything. And I don't want to look through the 37-page chart. So that's being a light end, especially if it's coming from Central Carolina. Y'all's charts are terrible. I can't, I, can't, I can't find anything in those things. It's like, God, when are they going to switch to Epic? Yeah, let me just upgrade. Uh, which is not weird, because uh, Duke Main Hospital, I don't know, y'all are affiliated exactly with Well, them. no, no, it's a life It's a life point. That's why yeah. I keep telling everybody that. Like, but it's Duke. Like, well, that's what it was. Oh, I'm going to work for Duke. No, uh, you're going to go to Duke Life Point. That's like, that's a, it's different. And like, I wish they would have. I was wish. Hmm. Sorry, it's nice to use, but I'm not. In our ability side, there's not. Yeah. yeah, so a lot of people come in. Epic? Oh, I know, I heard Epic's awesome. Yeah. It, it's, I wouldn't say awesome, but it's nice that I get a patient from another hospital that has Epic. I'm like, oh, look. I can see their labs have resulted. Concerner is, is wow. <laughs> wow. I was very thankful. Yeah, it's. Uh, they have his first bit, I think, it's a little bit easier. Yeah, so it, it's something to be said about a concise chart now. So, we're going to know responses to medications and interventions that have been performed um, to determine what, your, what that patient's response will be. They can provide the appropriate <coughs> clinical status. So if that patient um, has a CDP monitor in place, and that dopamine uh, drip is, you know, we've seen an actual uh, increase in their uh, their MAP, or we've seen, even, even without a CDP monitor, we've seen an increase in their urine output, their Foley catheter. We want to know, and, you know, when was the last time that Foley was empty? It's like, okay, so it was empty two hours ago, and they have 250 mLs. Well, how much urine production did they have before that? In a two-hour period, they had 60 mLs. Okay, so obvious, we're seeing obvious improvement. That's good. That's helpful information. If we've had two hours and you've only had 40 mLs of output, before that you had 60, we're not seeing any improvement, you know, with the dopamine. You know, you know I'd always get crap because the first thing that I do would be, oh, yeah, and, and if oh, you no, I want to see, I want to see, I want, I want to know. Um, color it is, whether it's, you know, that, 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 that. And we don't do a good job of explaining the appreciation of an indwelling catheter and the, the, the valuable data it gives to us to circulatory status. So um, that's part, we can talk about that a little bit later. This thing. But carry this thing around like it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I don't know why it stopped working. So, the, you know, I want to have the ability to anticipate a patient's needs during transport. You can do this by um, taking your on-scene assessment, said, along with your pre-arrival information, and they may dictate your transport mode. You may need to uh, dictate that, okay, I don't have the equipment to deal with this. Or, like, you didn't tell me the patient is on... You know, I'm trying to come up with a 
Because you didn't tell me the patient's got that in, uh, in a pellet in place and they need to go to UNC for LVAC. That would be good information. And you don't have an interventionist. Yeah. Well, I mean, we like we. So that's the, the wonderful side of my job is, um, you know, we don't transport patients out like that a lot. But if they're going to go for a transplant or an LVAD, then we do transport them out to UNC or do. So we'll take transport them with the impella. Well, guess who gets to go with the impella? So, because a critical, para, critical care paramedic nurse. Yeah, yeah. A critical care paramedic nurse. That's exactly who gets to go with the impella. There's three. There's three of us that get that get the lovely opportunity to go travel with that impella. Um, so it doesn't happen very often. Maybe four or five times a year. So thankfully, it doesn't happen very often. Um, but even even like the even last because last time I went I went with the UNC truck I had to go with their crew to transport the impella. Okay. I'm like, oh. I'm like that's. A, I, I thought it was odd, but okay, whatever. To each of their her own. We want to know the current patient status. We want to be, appreciate the uh, hemodynamic stability before transport to assess for potential deterioration again. Your assessment of everything kind of helps build this together. Pertinent information, mental status, trends, respiratory status, uh, diagnostic monitoring, um, pulse oximetry, entitled CO2, because, yeah, you're going to get that coming from the ER, um, unless they're on a bend. That's the only way you're going to get that. Mm -hmm. um, so peak uh, ventilatory compliance. And then if they are on a ventilator, Ventilator. Yeah, they are on a ventilator. Lord, excuse me. You got a lot of questions to ask. Um, I appreciably, and, and they'll talk about this when we have the respiratory event section. I appreciably query event settings, not just what they are currently, but what they were initially, and why they were changed, what they were changed to, and in correlation to the ABGs. We'll talk about all that when we get to ABGs later in the, later in this. But um, cardiovascular peripheral perfusion status, <clears throat> pulses, capillary refill, skin characteristics, all basic stuff that you can do tactically. When you go into EKGs, hemodynamic pressure findings, uh, laboratory studies, blood chemistry studies, and advanced imaging. We'll talk a little bit about uh, hemodynamics tomorrow or. Monday, Monday and or Tuesday. It's the same class, right? Yes. Okay. Monday and Tuesday. Um, and we'll talk about uh, you know CVP versus you know, arterial uh, status. So, assessment of different body systems on arrival. Again, you want to confirm the information provided by the transporting agents or tr by the transporting facility. Uh, baseline assessment to detect changes because you want to actually assess your patient. You actually, people look at me like I'm crazy when I actually oscillate a blood pressure with a blood pressure cuff. And it's, 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 it, it is a foreign damn concept these days. Um, I go up to a patient to assess the status of a patient on a unit that was having complications with the with a, a LVAD placement that we've done, right? L, uh, if L, if L, LVAD, I'll use that interchangeably. And I'm like, okay, well, you're not getting arterial waveform anymore. Why? You know, we got some problems here. And so I go, like, I need a stethoscope, and I want to listen listen for um, flow in my femoral arteries. I didn't burn my stethoscope. Was there one in the room? No. Like, what are we doing here? What, what, why, why are and the younger nurse that's newer? She had a stethoscope with her. She just didn't have it in the room. So I'm like, I, I, at first I thought nobody's got a big stethoscope right here. Nobody knows how to check blood pressure. Really, no necessarily need to check that blood pressure as much when I have an invasive monitor in place because it's accurate. It's got to be accurate. It's got to be accurate. But, uh, if I want to listen to part tones or or see if I can hear regurgitation. 
in the vials, then I need, the, I need uh, the stethoscope. So having proper tools. Sorry. Um, doop. Scrolling, 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 scrolling. Going back to um, initial assessments. Initial assessment. I mean, when we, we talked about this a little bit, we talked about National Registry um, review. Your initial assessment should take less than one minute unless you have to intervene for that life saving measure. Rapid assessment. I'm looking to see if there's something I need to do. I'm going to take my time, but I'm looking for a head assessing pupils. Airway compromise, middle st status changes, or if there's an airway in place, you know, what's the status of that airway? I'm also actually feeling. I'm looking, you know, if my patient's not intubated, and they're able to talk to me, I'm, actually, I'm having them open their mouth, I'm having them stick out their tongue, I'm doing a balance patty, having them bite their upper lip, going through that, that actual assessment. Feeling their neck, feeling for uh, problems, uh, problems with complications to... Uh, to the innovation or complex airway. Looking for soft tissue injuries. That was me. Mute. So looking at your tracheal deviation and JVD. Feeling the chest, looking at the chest, also taking the chest, um, feeling equal expansion, crepitus, looking for soft trauma, uh, abdomen, soft tissue injury, looking for distension, palpable masses, looking for pelvic instability. This is your basic rapid physical exam. Your goal of your rapid physical head to toe assessment is to identify critical injuries and intervene when, uh, to manage critical injuries. Your detailed physical exam is to identify conditions that may not um, be life-threatening, but could uh, definitely impact your care. So we assess the adequacy of interventions. This is a methodical, systematic method. <coughs> should be. You can do it however you see fit. Really. <laughs> How many of you have a hobby? What, what's a what, you got a hobby? What's your hobby? <laughs> okay. Do you, do you get ready? Do you get ready for bed the same same way every night? Okay. Never mind. You don't work. Um, anybody go play? Anybody play golf? Ride motorcycles. How do y'all people do? Yeah, that's basically it. Classes. I help run on non profit. I can hang out with my friend or my family. Yeah. I hang out with my parents. Okay. So. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you an example. Since nobody's biting on anything that's coming to, my, to mind of me right now, off the top of my head, I ride motorcycles, um, which I catch a lot of crap about because I was working at a trauma center on a trauma floor. Oh, you ride a motorcycle? Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, me and the trauma surgeon are going for the dragon. All right. <laughs> I was like, I was like, so, eat it. But anyways, when I go for a, because I catch a lot of crap about riding motorcycles. I really do. Because they're no motorcycles. Yeah, because yeah. the because we, we do see a lot of, I mean, I'm not, I, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't elude me that it's dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, I'm very, very careful about, I'm a very defensive driver. But then just fear there. When I go to ride my motorcycle, everything is done the exact same way every single time. I am very methodical. I go out, I make sure I have all my safety gear. I check my bike. I do a visual exterior inspection. I check the oil. I check the tire pressure every single time because I don't want to be a statistic. Do this every single time. Same thing when I'm doing a patient assessment. I approach every single patient assessment. 
the same way every single time. It is a methodical pattern that I go through at every step of the moment. And if someone interrupts me, Lord help me. Oh, because Lord. my squirrel moment is i got to start back over and figure out where the heck I stopped. Um, do you approach the patient from the same direction every time? Uh, it's sometimes that's impossible. Okay. Uh, but, you, but you have a preference. Gen generally, I, I, generally I'll, I approach you. Know, sometimes, depending on the room, you can't do that. Generally, I approach from the feet and come to the patient's right side. Generally, I do that. If the room doesn't dictate for that, then... Then, then, that then you adapt. adapt. Yeah, then I then I adapt. But there are but most of the time in a trauma Which in a trauma happen. room, I come I said I come in and the foot of the bed is toward the door, the open door, so I come in and go to the right. Obviously if there's somebody in my way, mm -hmm. I adapt. I don't necessarily like it, but I do. <laughs> but that goes to ensuring consistency and completeness every single time. So Again, we talked about what you're looking for, head, head, face, and airway. I'm also looking at the nasal cavity. Said so I'm also, uh, you know, palpating the, so palpating the back of the head. I'm looking in, looking in the ears, external structures. Um, very rarely do I find this instance the need to, set, to, to need an otoscope to actually look in the ears. But you're in the ER, there is one there if you need to, you need to do it. So, mm. okay. Oh, As usual, some of my links are not linking. But we Chest, we're inspecting for soft tissue, bruising, abrasions, lacerations, penetrations, palpating. Um, we're feeling for crepitus, paradoxical motion, instability. We're oscillating lung sounds. We're oscillating heart tones. Um, we're percussing. So we're assessing for respiratory distress. We're looking for retractions and evaluating the interventions. You know, talked about yesterday, we don't place chest tube critical care environment that can, uh, ser services can place chest tubes that is within the scope of practice. Most do not, but we can. But, in all likelihood, be called to transport patients with chest tubes. Chest drainage systems vary in, um, vary in how they function, or not how they function, vary in design. And I'll talk about chest drainage systems in thoracic trauma. But, I'm looking you know, if a patient has a chest tube in place, I am looking at the site. I'm assessing the site. I want to know the last time the dressing was changed. If it's sutured in place, I want to know the measurement. Make sure it's clean, dry, intact. And then I work my way out from the from the site down the chest tube. Make sure there's no dependent loops in it to the chest drainage system. I'm looking at the chest drainage system to make sure it's intact. Make sure it's got a we got either, if it's a water seal. Make sure it has the appropriate amount of water in it, and I'm documenting where the uh, the level is. Most of the time, you're not going to need to change a chest drainage system. They're a sealed system, so if you have to empty it, you have to change the chest drainage system. Usually, I'll just put a mark as where where the amount is and call that a day. Only downside is if you knock it over, then you got to figure out where your fluid has moved from which compartment. And me, I'm gonna knock it over. Come on, I'm just that. I'm just that clumsy. So abdomen, I'm looking, um, you know, looking at it. If there's distension, if there's trauma, I'm looking first. Uh, then I'm oscillating. So then I'm, you know, palpating. So then I'm, you know, percussing. I'm not. Uh, or I'm sorry. Then I'm so. Looking first, and then I'm oscillating, and then I'm percussing, and I'm palpating. Uh, you want to look, listen, feel. Reason we look first, we don't want to disturb anything. When we listen, we're still not disturbing anything. And when we're feeling, we're getting a little more aggressive each time. Um, I'm listening for bowel sounds, sound. I'm listening for renal breeze. So I'm evaluating any um, if there's any abdominal. Uh, 
drainage devices, whether it be NGs or OGs, if they're hooked up to suction, if they're intermittent suction, how much they output it, if they're not hooked up to suction, if they're capped, etc. I want to know how effective and what they're doing. Yeah, um, pelvis and gastro gastrourinary. I'm looking for deformity, trauma. So I'm evaluating if there's a Foley catheter in place. If there's not a Foley catheter in place, why? Why is there not one? If they're a critical, critically ill patient that needs a critical care transport, why is there not a Foley in place? Is there a reason? Um, does it happen? Absolutely, it happens to patients that don't have, have Foley's, but if they're sick and I need to evaluate a, evaluate circulatory status or perfusion status, Foley catheter is amazing. Uh, it's a poor man's CBP. That is a amazing way to do it if I don't have, have a uh, um, central, you know, a central monitoring line. Extremities, we can't uh, neglect them. We want to make sure we look for so, trauma, peripheral, so peripheral perfusion, pulse motor and sensory. So uh, palpation, crepitus, deformity, uh, evaluation of interventions, the review of imaging studies. I got a guy uh, the other day, uh, in, he was coming in, he was transferred to our facility for a peripheral intervention because he had cold foot. Got a cold. Not really that, that big a deal, had a cold foot. Um, one foot. Do it. Unless you have one cold foot. Did have one cold foot. He had He had an obstruction. <laughs> he ended up losing the foot. Actually, he ended up losing the leg below the knee. Because, in addition to his cold foot, someone, and probably in all reality, it was a good idea that for genius ran um, a full lab panel and had an elevated troponin. Huh. <coughs> So yes, will that folks have to having that intervention because he has to heart cath first to clear him for the surgery. The surgery and uh, <coughs> that ends up that ends up having major, major, major vessel issues. <coughs> he has to have the intervention. It <coughs> delays his peripheral intervention becomes gangrenous and delicious. <coughs> Saved his life because the had he gone to the the strain on the heart would kill him. So, yeah. diabetes is a hell of, hell of a damn. Um, and this, yeah, it's a, it's a hell of a disease. So, uh, documentation, we talked about Imtala and Cobra earlier. Uh, imaging studies is an important thing for Mattel and Cobra. If you are going to um, going to take a patient, and they have imaging studies. Absolutely, take um, take copies of the images with you because the uh, you know the receiving facility may not have uh, a link up to PAX or to whatever system it may be. They may not be able to pull that data, so they absolutely need the hard copy of whatever imaging study you do. Patient discussion of patient family condition, talk with the family before departure. Again, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Explain to them what's going on. Um, they said our, you know, our procedure is to have pre-printed directions to wherever we're going, if we're going somewhere we normally go. Um, explain you know, how we're going to get there, explain what's how, what happened during transport, contact numbers, all that stuff. You know, usually I try to send them on down the road before we ever leave. Just because that way they're not trying to play catch up to the ambulance. Uh, especially if. Hmm? Yeah, which is always fun. Um, that does bite us sometimes because we'll divert to another facility. Uh, we end up stopping and the patient gets put on a helicopter, transferred to a different facility and route. It happens. So sometimes we have to make decisions. And, um, I, I did a. Uh, took a Pediatric, he got, uh, he rolled. This was actually pretty amazing. The scene call um, got brought to our ER, little, little small ER, 7-bit ER, the 
same call was for cardiac arrest for pediatric. In the back story, he and his brother rolled their four-door UTV, like four-seater UTV over, laying on his chest. And this is a uh, like an 11-year-old kid. Dad gets there, and I said, they see Dad picking and lifting this thing up. The thing's got to be 2,000 pounds. I mean, he's, I know he's a, I know he's a uh, special forces guy and he's strong and ripped and all that. But good miss when they say he ripped this, lifted this thing up, and the other son pulled the kid out from underneath, did CPR on his own kid. But anyways, where I was going with that is, um, we said, all right, well, patient's uh, going to UNC. You know, we're leaving the hospital. Our leg's going to UNC. At the last minute, patient's getting ready to go to the aircraft. Like, oh, we got weather coming in from UNC. We're going to divert their department to Baptist to Children's. Like, well, patient's already left going to UNC. Uh, nobody had contact information from family. So, ended up, like, from uh, somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who was actually able to get a hold of them. But always making sure you have contact information. Uh, because things happen. We have changes in status at the last minute. Answer all questions as truthfully and diplomatically as you can. Um, you know, provide as much information as humanly possible. If the patient is in a, if it, if it is a serious life-threatening emergency, make sure they know that. Um, if there is a, hopefully it has been explained to them, you know, this patient, their patient condition is very serious. Uh, that is one of the things I hate the worst is have to explain, um, you know, to a mother or a father or you know, a brother or a sister that, you know, yes, this is very serious. Um, your daughter or family member is critically ill and may die. I hate that. I do. Um, but try to be as honest as I can to, one, not give false reassurance. And make sure that everyone knows what's going on. I had to do that to uh, actually do it on the phone to this 33 year old's mother on Wednesday. Yes, this is life threatening. We're doing everything we can. But she's in a grave, grave condition. Didn't tell her we're sitting here doing CPR on her daughter, but you know, it, it's not the best place to be. Um, patient assessment and preparation for your transport is absolutely the cornerstone of everything that we do. Um, you can set the tone for your uh, transport. It can be smooth and trouble-free. You can be prepared ahead of time, or it can be rough and problematic. Choice is really yours. I want to show y'all one thing. So I said I would show it to you. Today, if I can get to show up here, uh, it's not going to. This is one of those squirrel things that I said I'd show you, and it is diabetes pictures, yeah. So I have a picture put. On, I have to put it into a PowerPoint so it'll actually show up where you can actually see it because my screen and that screen are totally different. So, um, say so this is a. And I'll have to go pull up one of a patient with normal coronaries so you can see. But this is a patient with diabetes. You see the microvascular, the tiny little vessels. Um, these are blockages that actually exist here, but this is normal for this patient uh, because of the microvascular plugging. Uh, those vessels are probably um, in the circumflex, which you get down past uh, my pointer. In the circumflex, once you get down past about here, are probably 2.0 millimeters um, in diameter. That's not normal for a circumflex. LED, LED is already smaller than that. That's 
This is the LED. You consider LED generally should be bigger. It is a uh, so those are well smaller than 2.0 millimeters. There's nothing we can actually do to improve the flow on that other than bypass it. Um, this is the right coronary artery, which in a 39-year-old uh, diabetic patient should not be dumped off like that. Let's see if I can let me find healthy coronaries. versus normal coronaries. Big difference. Um, we still see, there's still some small blockages, but the LID is much larger, much more, uh, more profound. You don't see the microvasculature, um, you know, the shrinking of the vessels themselves. Uh, the right is, I mean, that's a right dominant patient by all means, uh, you know, a, a dominant right system. But, they're just a lot larger, right? You see these. I always um, relate them to like whippy, talking about babies, whippy white toys, babies, whippy white feet. The diabetic or coronary arteries are so you can just see them as soon as you inject You have diabetes. No, oh, well, I'm pretty sure you're wrong. I'm pretty sure I can tell you if you're looking at your coronary arteries, you have diabetes because the disease is, process is so. Um, impactful, which is why we see patients with diabetes with peripheral neuropathies and peripheral vascular disease, and they have, have all these problems because the microvasculature problems that, that, that accompany diabetes is profound. So, someone with no other risk factors other than diabetes, that's a huge risk factor, regardless of family history, regardless of uh, you know, lifestyle. Right? If they have diabetes, that's a huge risk factor, regardless of what where their age is at that point. What do you start adding there? Hyperlipidemia, hyper, high cholesterol, uncontrolled blood pressure, uh, family history of heart disease. You know, the 33 year old that coming in all of a sudden looks like, okay, we might have a serious problem here. So that's all. I just wanted to illustrate. I said I'd show you the comparison between the two. That's a pretty big difference, I think, personally. All right, I told you uh, 3.30. That's pretty close. Um, I say we call that a day. Um, thank you, everybody, for... I thought I was talking to...